So this video is gonna get into the topic of selective attention, meaning our ability to focus in on one thing even when there are a bunch of other things or other stuff going on. Like someone could be watching this video in a busy coffee shop and despite 20 conversations all happening in the same room, not to mention all the moving around and bright colors of different clothing and stuff like that, even so we can still focus on this video, at least for a while or with some effort. So that's selective attention. It's being able to focus your conscious awareness on one particular stimulus or, or one particular source like being engaged in one conversation at a party, even though other people nearby are also chatting. So if you're engaged in your conversation and paying attention to it, you'll probably have no idea what other people are talking about. Whereas if you zone out and you stop selectively attending, you might catch pieces of another conversation, decide it's interesting enough to covertly shift your selective attention to the other conversation while nodding mindlessly at the people right in front of you, this ability to selectively attend to one conversation among many others has been called the cocktail party effect. And the question of how our brain is able to do that is called the cocktail party problem. It's an intrinsically challenging problem because there can be so much freaking information going into our ears all at once, we can't possibly process all of it fully. So how exactly do we hone in on one source instead of getting overwhelmed by the cacophony and the chaos of all of it? So. I want to start with a classic study by Cherry in 1953, where he studied the cocktail party problem. He studied it systematically to understand how we're able to follow one conversation among a bunch of others and, and sort of when that selective attention might sometimes fail. So the question is, how do you simulate the basic idea of the cocktail party situation in a laboratory without bringing a whole bunch of people in to have a party? So how do you get it down to the fundamentals? And his clever idea was to put people in headphones where they're wearing these headphones that play a different conversation to each ear. So it's just gonna be two conversations, not four or five or 10, but this is enough to let us study the phenomenon, the basic idea to understand those mechanisms of selective attention. So his solution of using headphones like that, it's called a dichotic listening task, meaning we play a different message to each ear. And in this case, what he did is make participants pay attention to one side rather than the other by giving them a task. They had to shadow one side, meaning they had to repeat that side out loud. That's how we ensured that they were paying attention to that side and not the other. So in the example here, uh, the guy's right ear, it's saying the horses galloped across the field, but that would be at the same time the left ear is saying, President Lincoln often read by the light of the fire. And he has to say out loud whatever he hears in the left sound stream. That's a dichotic listening task. We use that a lot for um, auditory research these days. Now, it takes some concentration, just like it takes some concentration to stay focused on one conversation at a party, but people can do this task. When you ask afterward what was said in the opposite side, the unattended channel, we've generally got no idea because we weren't attending to it. But then what Cherry did is he manipulated some elements of the situation as independent variables to see how those changes affected things. For example, in the unattended side, he tried changing like major physical properties, like the gender of the voice or changing from someone speaking to, to just playing a tone on that side. So he made some major changes to physical properties on that unattended side. And sure enough, people did notice that it had changed even though they hadn't been attending to that side and they had no idea what was being spoken over there, but they noticed something changed. Meanwhile, in other conditions, he tried a manipulation where the unattended side changes, but it changes the meaning, the semantics, or what's being talked about, like the stuff at the level of understanding a language rather than just general big picture sound properties. And in this case, people don't notice. People have no idea if the unattended side switches to a completely new topic, or even if it switches to a different language entirely, or if we start playing the speech backwards, no idea. Just not noticed when it's on the side that we're not attending to. So this tells us something important about how selective attention works. Some information, some aspects of the stimulus from the environment get through even for things we're not paying attention to, but other aspects don't get through and don't get processed unless we're actually attending to them. So the, the upshot, the takeaway from Cherry's famous study is that unattended stuff doesn't disappear altogether even when we're not attending to it, but only basic low level information from those stimuli seem to be getting through on the unattended channel. For higher level processing where we have to go deeper into making sense of it about like the meaning of something, the details, 
that seems to require attending to it. It requires attentional processes, which again, on the side we're not attending to, then we're not going to get the meaning out of it. That's kind of what Cherry found. Now, if you're not already using headphones, but maybe you have a pair handy, I suggest you put them on for this brief demo I'm going to do so you can see what a dichotic listening task is like. It'll still make sense if you have stereo speakers, but it's just more true to the experimental paradigm if you use headphones. So pause the video and then play it when you got your headphones on and ready. Okay, here we go. If you're playing along, just try to shadow the list of words being read out loud one at a time. While meanwhile, on the other side, some lady is going to be reading about copyright law. Except as otherwise and, provided in this title, uh, as used in this title, the following two, terms and their variant forms mean the following. An anonymous a, work is a work on the copies or phonorecords of which no natural person is, is identified as author. It, An architectural work is the design of a building as embodied in any tangible medium of expression, including a building, architectural plans, or drawings. The work includes the overall form on, as... Yeah, so that, that's the idea of dichotic listening. And you can see how it represents a simplified form of the cocktail party problem so that we can test selective attention in the lab. And of course, we might do things like have them try and remember the words that they were hearing on the other side. And we might use more complicated words than you heard in that demo there just to make sure that they're really attending to that side and not paying attention to the other side. Now, lots of researchers have used this type of experimental paradigm and, and built on Cherry's experiment with their own variations just to try and figure out a more basic model of how attention works in general. So for example, a researcher named Broadbent came up with what's called an early filter model of attention. The idea can be depicted in this kind of information processing model drawn here. On the left, we've got the input, meaning the stimulus, like all the sound coming to our, into our ears. And some of it is in the attended channel, while some of it's in the unattended channel. All of it gets into early sensory processing, like it goes to the primary auditory cortex and the temporal lobe for basic early processing. But then Broadbent proposed that there's a filter here that stops information in the unattended channel from being processed any further. Like, it doesn't go to those later stages where things like binding occur or where gestalt principles come into play or where other perceptual processes actually lead to us perceiving something consciously. Only the, the attended channel gets through the filter and gets this later stage of processing, which then means, you know, we can be conscious of and do things with the information that got through to that level of perceiving. And then we can use it in short term memory or what today we might call working memory. And from there, we can use that info to respond. In other words, the output side of the information processing model here on the right. So Broadbent proposed that this filtering happens early on prior to perceiving and understanding the content of the input, which means the filter has to analyze things based only on simple, low-level features like pitch and loudness, basic stuff, the kind of stuff that distinguishes a stereotypical male voice from a stereotypical female voice. And then this filter only lets through information that matches the source we're attending to in terms of those low-level major physical characteristics. But if this model is correct, that means we can't filter based on meaning since meaning requires getting to later processing, like perception and memory kind of stuff. And, and that seems right, doesn't it? It totally fits with what we learned from Cherry's study. But there's a problem. The problem is, while it explains Cherry's results, it doesn't explain some other results we find with the same dichotic listening task. Like, we notice some semantic meaning-based things in the unattended channel. For example, our name being spoken. Even Cherry found this in his original work. If you speak someone's name in the other side, they will suddenly notice their attention will be brought over there. You've probably had this happen at, at like a group event where you're having a conversation, but suddenly notice someone is talking about you and your attention gets drawn to that other conversation, even though you definitely were not attending to that conversation a moment ago. And if you had been asked, you would not have been able to tell what those people had been talking about. So, Evidence like this and, and evidence from other researchers like uh, Neville Moray suggested that some things of personal significance or, or importance seem to get through and get processed in the unattended side, the unattended channel, and they can be like noticed or draw our attention to that channel even though we weren't attending to them, even though they weren't being processed at a conscious level before that. But that means at least some parts of the unattended channel must have been getting through further into processing than Broadbent's early filter model like this one allows. So 
Sometimes we'll see a different model, like Deutsch and Deutsch in the 60s, Diana Deutsch, they, they argued for a late filter model where everything gets in and processed at the level of meaning. So stuff does get into that perceptual stage, but only relevant information gets further processing and goes to our short-term memory or working memory and, and guides our action. So they just put the filter further into the flow chart here. That means in their model, all these conversations that, that you're listening to are being processed unconsciously and your brain is making sense of the words without you being aware of any of that. But then the channel you're paying attention to transfers that meaning and that understanding into our short-term or working memory so that we can use the information and, and remember that we heard it. Now, in some versions of this late filter model, the, the late filter was in addition to an earlier filter. But either way, this model makes some sense for explaining how like we could catch our own name right? But it also implies some weird stuff. Like it suggests that our brain is actually processing and understanding 10 different conversations at once when we're in a crowded room, right? All of the conversations are getting through and getting processed to that perceptual level. That would be pretty impressive, but also pretty surprising. And if you think about it, pretty damn wasteful since most of that processing is for nothing and doesn't get sent onward. Now, meanwhile, Anne Treisman, the researcher who came up with the feature integration theory, she also developed an alternative model for how we do selective attention. So instead of an early filter model or a late filter model, Treisman's model, rather than being a filter model, has been called an attenuator model. So it's, it's sometimes called the early attenuator model. So rather than a full-on filter that blocks the unattended channel, there's a mechanism to sort of really boost the attended channel, kind of like turning its volume knob up and letting more of it through. But simultaneously, it weakens the unattended channel, kind of like turning its volume knob down or letting less of it through or making it require more of a threshold for it to reach conscious awareness. So in this case, everything gets through to the next stage of processing, but some of it gets processed a lot more thoroughly and enters conscious awareness. While the unattended side doesn't enter consciousness and is only processed behind the scenes and also less thoroughly. But that behind the scenes unconscious processing, that can help the brain identify some important patterns that it may need to kind of bring to conscious awareness and draw your attention to them. So those things based on past experience, you could say have like a lower threshold for grabbing your attention. So for example, the sound combination that makes up your name, which you've heard a million times, lots of past experience, and it's been very relevant to you, that might have a very low threshold for setting things off during this unconscious processing and then shifting our attention to that unattended channel. But otherwise, stuff in the unattended channel, things have to reach a, a pretty significant threshold to go past unconscious processing and that simple level of processing to deeper or more conscious processing where we notice it and can make use of it in memory and things like that. Whereas that attended channel, the one we are attending to, we've already kind of focused in on it. So we are consciously aware of it that the whole time, right? So that's Treisman's early attenuator model. And sure enough, there is some, some good evidence supporting it. For example, she found that if you switch message sides in the decodic listening task, like they were hearing about Abraham Lincoln in their left ear and suddenly out of the blue, it's in their right ear finishing the sentence, like mid sentence about Abraham Lincoln. It was in the left ear. Now the sentence is finished in the right ear. You switch to mid sentence people can still catch the very first words of that attended message, right? The Abraham Lincoln message, even though it's now on the side that they were ignoring, like they were totally not paying attention to the right side of the headphones, but suddenly we swap Abe Lincoln over there mid sentence and they don't miss out on some of the words during that transition, which you might've expected, right? Because they weren't paying attention, but that tells us their brain must've been sending through information from that side all along in order for the person to be able to catch it a little bit after the fact. So that fits better with her model than something like, you know, Broadbent's early filter model. Now, nowadays, the modern synthesis of these models is a little more complex than a, just a simple attenuator, but that basic idea still fits. And in general, there's some pre-attentive or unconscious processing where especially physical properties, but usually not meaning they get processed quickly in parallel and automatically. And then there's, separately or, or afterwards there's some attentive processing in which like meaning and detail get processed but more slowly and in serial not in parallel and in a later stage of processing kind of further into the brain and this part seems to require at least some amount of attentional resources which of course are finite right not infinite and really this sounds a lot like the heart of 
feature integration theory, where we also had pre-attentive parallel processing for simple or low-level stuff that was done behind the scenes, out of our awareness, but then some later deeper processing that required limited attentional resources, so it was slower and we can only do so much at once. So it all kind of fits together, right? But that's enough for our overview of selective attention. In the next video, I want to spend a little more time on this idea that our attentional resources are limited. So we're going to talk about divided attention, like whether we can attend to a TV show and a lecture video at the same time, or text our friend while also sitting on the couch conversing with our partner. So I'll see you in the next video.